All right, let's do this. We are on Rockford Reading, Episode 2. Rockford Reading Daily, Episode 2. We are reading Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Uh, we are on Chapter 1, Hate Crimes. Hate Crimes, June 14, 1998. The barbaric torture and murder of James Byrd Jr. by three white men, Sean A. Berry, Lawrence Russell Brewer, and John W. King, in the tiny Texas town of Jasper, has become a summertime feast for an insatiable American media, but it is a meal that consists largely of spectacle. On June 7, 1998, Berry, King, and Brewer offered Mr. Byrd a ride home. Instead, they shackled Mr. Bird's feet to a chain and dragged him behind their truck for miles. The vigor with which the latest race murder is being covered is strikingly contrasted with the lackluster coverage of a similar case from over a year ago in Virginia, where a young black man, in the company of a few white drinking buddies, was beaten, burned, and as he took too long to die, decapitated with an axe. Why is one story a national firestorm and another a local curiosity? Why is one an unquestioned hate crime and the other merely a case of, quote, boys being boys, end quote, or a bad mix of liquor and bad company? This is so because the media said it was so and because the local police told them this. When is a hate crime a hate crime? When it is a crime, when is it a crime of hate or when the police say it is? Excuse me, let me repeat that again. When is a hate crime a hate crime? When it is a crime of hate or when the police say it is? And if the cops are to be the arbiters of what is or isn't a hate crime, who will judge the cops without bias? Hold on, give me one second. Let me readjust how I'm sitting out here. My fault. I hope that ain't too loud in the mic. Okay. Sorry about that, y'all. <clears throat> in late April 1998, New Jersey state troopers pumped over 11 shots into a van occupied by four black and Hispanic students who were on their way to basketball tryouts at Central University in North Carolina, seriously wounding three of the four young men. Thanks to the infamous quote, racial profiling, end quote, program of the New Jersey State Police, the four never made it to tryouts that day because they were found guilty of the unwritten crime of DWB, driving while black. Despite a rain of lies alleging that the basketball players were speeding, attempted to run the cops down, and so on, it soon became clear that the boys had done nothing, nothing except exist. Ain't each of the 11 bullet holes evidence of a hate crime? In Chicago, a man named Carl Hardiman was shot and wounded by a city cop for refusing to drop his, quote, weapon, end quote, a cell phone. Ain't that a hate crime? New York Black Panther Shep McDaniel was brutally beaten by six cops in the Bronx as he attempted to peacefully monitor and note an altercation between police and two women. New York's finest shouted, quote, he's a crazy fucking nigger, end quote, as they punched, kicked, stumped and cuffed McDaniel. A jury later acquitted McDaniel of resisting arrest and disorderly conduct. Was not his beating, brutalization, trumped up arrest, and bogus prosecution a hate crime? On May 13, 1985, Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on a home in a residential black neighborhood where 11 men, women, and children, members of the Naturalist Move group, were incinerated and dismembered by cops. The sole adult survivor, Ramona Africa, was prosecuted, convicted, and sent to prison for seven years. Ain't that a hate crime? In many ways, black America remains captive to its feverish, hateful history in a land that daily mocks the claim to being, quote, the home of the free, end quote. We have become conditioned by corporate misleaders who make a spectacle out of occasional acts of racial hatred while ignoring the structural ones that degrade the everyday life of millions of Americans. Why do we pay attention to the retail acts of anti-black violence while ignoring the wholesale? Far more dangerous than the white robe KKK is the legalized malice of the black robe judiciary. 
Far more destructive than the Aryan nation are the local armed and uniformed police who are legal agents of an ancient deadly hatred. And that brings us to the end of hate crime. Uh, and the way Mumia Abu-Jamal writes this uh, book is, uh, is very uh, poetic, in my opinion. Uh, the sections are broken up into different, you know, two, three pages excerpts, like how we just read passages, two, three pages, pa two, three pages of passages. What up, what up with you? Uh, and he sort of covers a, a specific murders that have happened or specific time periods when murders happened or a specific overall theme about the murders that have happened and and so when he asked in there are, are all these aren't all these these macro aggressions that have happened to black people hate crimes even though they haven't been labeled hate crimes and haven't gotten the uh attention that uh, uh this the prominent hate crime at that time had gotten uh, who was it to determine if these things were hate crimes or not? And how come if these things were done out of a, a deep seated ancient hatred, hatred, how come they how come they weren't being classified as hate crimes? And uh, I think another one of the another one of the things that rings very uh, true that uh, Mamiya Abu-Jamal pointed out is uh, how we ignore the. Uh, wholesale hate crimes and the wholesale racist acts of racism that uh, exist and in wholesale institutions of racism that exist. Uh, we overlook those for the retail uh, hate crimes or the retail racism that exists and the the the, the individual racism that exists. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that we have to do the job of educating our children and educating our, our neighbors and brothers and sisters of understanding the importance of attacking the wholesale racism, the institutions of racism. Uh, uh, Mamiya pointed out the uh, how dangerous the judiciary system is and how dangerous judges are and even and how they have more of a a direct correlation to the racism that exists in the Ku Klux Klan has. Uh, and that is something that is true. It's the same thing for state's attorneys and for police officers and all of these uh, institutions that are built up and push out this propaganda, uh, push out these lies and stereotypes about uh, black people and the black community. They are a much bigger threat and a much bigger danger than the Ku Klux Klan ever was or the White Citizens Council ever was or uh, any uh, or white national nationalists or, or Nazis, you know, could ever be because of the political power that they will, because of the uh, power for that mainstream media, the power of mainstream media echoing the sentiments that they put out. Uh, and so I think that that is one of the things we have to begin to turn our eye towards. We have to begin to stop looking at individual acts of racism uh, as the end all be all and begin to look at institutional acts of racism as the end all be all with the understanding that getting rid of individual racism will not eradicate institutional racism. But if you eradicate institutional racism, uh, you will begin to see the direct trickle down effect of getting rid of individual racism. You will begin to see people uh, learn that there is a direct uh, uh, consequence for individual racism by seeing the things that are happening to these institutions that are uh, perpetrating out racism. So uh, I t that was one of the things that I, some of the things I pulled away from that first, that first chapter there. Or first passage, I should say. It's not really a chapter. Okay, next is The Law Against the Law. June 20th, 1998. Quote, if it took the white majority more than 200 years to understand that slavery was wrong and approximately 100 years to realize that segregation was wrong, and many still don't understand, how long will it take them to perceive the American criminal justice is evil? End quote. Paul Butler. As long as 1880, the United States Supreme Court in Strouder v. West Virginia ruled that the, quote, defendant does have the right to be tried by a jury whose members are selected pursuant to non-discriminatory criteria, end quote. Over a century later, in 1986, the nation's highest court reiterated this principle in Batson v. Kentucky, for although a century had passed, it remained all too common for trials to be conducted before all white or predominantly white juries in cases where it appeared as if, besides the defendant, only the judge's robes were black. It also shows us that no matter what the Supreme Court does, the judiciary, prosecutors, and police will do what they want to with impunity. 
especially when blacks are defendants. For if Shrouder was the quote law, end quote, why did it need reiteration in Batson? Shrouder was ignored in U.S. courtrooms for 106 years, just as Batson is today. As any law student knows, the theory of law is vastly different from its practice. Shortly after Batson was decided in 1986, an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia gave a class to district attorney trainees, teaching them how to violate the spirit of Batson by ensuring that most blacks will be removed from jury pools. Much time has passed since Batson, and yet cases are upheld today where a black defendant sees black jurors removed for bogus reasons. What is the quote law, end quote? What the Supreme Court says or what district attorneys do? What the cases say or what trial judges allow? The quote law, end quote, is what is allowed every day in real cases, in real courtrooms across America, and not what is written in dry, dusty books read by hoary scholars. Seen from this perspective, Batson is still not the law, despite what books may say. And if the process is not tainted enough, what are the consequences of such a process? Recently, the governor of a state that boasts a spate of Batson violations, Pennsylvania, signed Senate Bill 423 into law, thereby enacting a statute that forbids a death penalty appeal based on the following. A claims that blacks are more likely to be executed for the same crime than whites. B, claims that an indigent defendant is more likely to be executed than a rich one. Or C, claims that a death sentence is excessive or disproportionate to the penalty imposed in similar cases. This is, essentially, a law against the quote law, end quote. It is a proclamation of the supremacy of the political over the legal. It is a statute that explicitly enforces the value that white life matters and black life does not. It is a law of the state that exclaims the inherent superiority of the wealthy over the poor and that allows the basis disproportion to masquerade as, quote, justice, end quote. It is a statement that reflects a hellish, unequal status quo that still has not changed no matter what the U.S. Supreme Court says and no matter how many times it says it. It is the law of what was, what is, and what may be. And then that brings us to the end of that passage. Uh, give me one second here. Let me, one second here. I want to check where we at on time. I know we still got time to go. I just want to see where we at. Uh, like I, I, I said in the first episode, one of the things we want to try to do with these Rafa reading dailies at least at this point right now, is to try to keep them between 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, that way is something that's easily digestible and uh, people can get in the routine of, of picking up and listening to. And if people miss a few, they won't be too far behind to try to uh, catch up. It won't be too many, uh, too long of uh, episodes to catch up. Uh, so we're at about the 13, 13 and a half minute mark here. So what I, my thoughts on that passage that we just read, uh, first is, uh, and this is something that I've said time and time again, but there is a, a, an inherent danger in working to change laws before you have changed the minds of people, working to change policies before you have changed the consciousness of the society. Uh, because you get into a place where you have something written down in policy or you have something written down in law, uh, but you need people to enforce those policies. You need people to enforce those laws. And typically the people who get the laws passed and get the policies passed passed and written and voted on are not the same people who enforce them. Uh, they are not the same people uh, uh, who oversee them. Their, the, the, their job sort of ends with the writing of it and the passing of it. Uh, and so if, if the job is not done for the the, the society and the community to have changed their thought process with certain things, to change their perspective on certain things, even though the policy is written differently, uh, it won't be upheld. And so one of the things that Mumia uh, pointed out here and, and asked here is, uh, uh, what you know? What is the law? Is the law what is written down on paper, or is the law what happens in courtrooms every day? 
Uh, and the same thing can be stated for, you know, some of these police reform bills that we've seen happen where in certain places uh, a chokehold is banned or a chokehold is not supposed to be used anymore. But uh, when a police officer puts somebody in a chokehold and it's on camera, there's no consequence for it. There's no recourse uh, for it to be a consequence for it. Uh, and so the same thing for a lot of uh, uh the things that go on in, in courtrooms, especially on the uh, local level, uh, they are things that if that are that have been found to be unjust or illegal uh, on the Supreme Court level. And one of those things uh, is is being judged by a, a jury of your peers. Uh, and we have seen and it still happens to this day where people uh, who are of color are judged by a jury where nobody on the jury is of color. Uh, and so what does it matter if it's a law that says you have to be judged by a jury of your peers if when it's time for your jury to be put together, uh, the prosecution has ways to ensure that you are not judged by the jury of your peers. Uh, and so that is, again, that is why we, uh, the same way that is, uh, you, you regularly see people talking about the doing work on the inside or changing policy or changing laws or getting new people in seats. Uh, we have to understand that we need uh, uh, even more uh, uh, militant stance when it comes to uh, being on the outside of these systems and uh, working within our communities and working with the uh, with our neighbors and working with an organization and, and grassroots efforts to change the consciousness of the community and change the consciousness of the society so that way that we can uh, the people who are supposed to uphold and enforce these laws and policies that are being changed, their minds have been changed, so they are more willing to enforce them. And so that way we are changing the minds of the community. So if those people won't enforce them, the community is now in a position where they are conscious enough to hold those people accountable for not enforcing those things. Uh, and then I think one of the other things I would just again point out is uh, the inherent racism that exists in in uh, that is systemic in uh, the criminal justice system and the the legal system, the judicial system, and when we uh, read and hear that uh, in Pennsylvania they signed a bill that made it so that you could not uh, try to overturn the death penalty, or you couldn't get, try to get in the they signed a bill in Pennsylvania. Uh, that made it so that you cannot appeal if you have been uh, found guilty of a crime and given the death penalty. If your appeal was going to be based on the claim that blacks are more likely to be executed for the same crime than whites. Uh, and that's a, a factual statement. It is a fact that if you are black, you are more likely to be executed uh, for the same crime as a white person. If you and a white person are both convicted. Uh, and so that is an inherent uh, a racist uh, a bill to be passed. Uh, the same thing claims that uh, an indigent defendant, which is a poor defendant, is more likely to be executed than a rich one. Uh, that is a statement of fact that if uh, you enter into the criminal justice system, if you are arrested at any point and enter into the, the, the criminal justice system that we have now, a person who is poor is uh, at a, a much higher risk of having unjust actions happen to them than a person who is rich. Uh, that is something that uh, now, again, when you you start getting into the nuances of this, I don't want to say this statement and make it seem like it's a blanket statement. But there are plenty of situations where a poor white person will be worse off in the criminal justice system than a rich black person uh, may be because of the fact that going and being able to afford a lawyer uh, gets you into a place where you are now dealing with issues of class. And if you can afford a lawyer that's good enough, uh, you can get off on something that you could be more uh, blatantly have done or be blatantly have evidence against you that somebody who's poor and is stuck with a public defender uh, and their case is something that is uh, blatant that they didn't do uh, because of the fact that a public defender does not have the same amount of time to dedicate to a case that a, a private lawyer does. A public defender most likely is going to have a heavier workload than a private lawyer is going to have. Uh, and uh, since we live in a capitalistic society, there is no denying that the majority of people in this society are more motivated when they feel that they are gaining capital from something. And a public defender is not being directly compensated from each person that they are representing. And so you inherently, as somebody who is poor, once you enter into this system, are at a humongous disadvantage. And so uh, that's a, cl a classist law. Uh, and then even within there, 
because of the fact that uh, black people and people of color in this society, for the most part, uh, live at a uh, or have a, a lesser income uh, and live at a uh, uh, closer to the poverty level, the law not only is classist, it's also racist because it's, dis it's going to disproportionately affect black people and people of color. Uh, I think we got enough time to, to knock one more of these passages out and do a, a review on it. So, all right, let's pick up. Let's pick up here. We are blind to everything but color. July 5th, 1998. Quote, in order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way. End quote. Justice Harry Blackman, University of California, Regents versus Bach, 1978. In cases decided every day across America, the theory of color blindness said to govern the judicial process is a reflection of the flawed notion that the mere mention of race is somehow racist. Consequently, the law serves up yet another legal fiction, which obscures the complexity of real life and furtherance of a false and fatal simplicity. There can be no sustained study of American law without coming face to face with the racism that drenches judicial thought in a clear, unapologetic tone that leaves no question as to the objectives of the court. It is obvious that the objection on the part of Congress is not due to color as color, but only to color as an evidence of a type of inferior civilization that it characterizes. Yellow and bronze as racial colors are the hallmarks of Asian despotisms. It was deemed that the subjects of these despotisms, with their fixed and ingrained pride of their, of their particular culture, which accepts the subordination of the individual and community to the, supreme personal with, to the supreme personal authority of the sovereign as the embodiment of the state, were not well suited to further the success of a republican form of government, hence they were denied citizenship. The anti-Asian bias that oozes out of the 1921 decision, Terrace versus Thompson, U.S. District Court, Washington, for example, which is clothed in a kind of quasi-sociological justification, actually justified laws in Western regions that outlawed the sale of land or property to Japanese people on the basis of ineligibility of citizenship. Until the 1950s, the Chinese and other Asians were denied naturalization. Despite our pretensions of being, quote, colorblind, end quote, scholars assure us that over a century after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1884 became law, the court case that upheld the act remains good law to this day. The U.S. Supreme Court majority in Chai Chan Ping v. U.S. 1889 found, quote, the presence of foreigners of a different race in this country who will not assimilate with us, end quote, to be properly excludable. For over a century, such decisions that made whiteness the sole prerequisite for U.S. citizenship and explicitly excluded people it deemed, quote, non-white, end quote, had, at their very core, not, quote, color blindness, end quote, but color consciousness distorted by a profound sense of white supremacy. It is fitting here to note that in 1935, the two countries that had racial restrictions or naturalization in common were Hitler's Germany and the United States of America's. Color blindness? For the better part of two centuries, race has been at the very heart of law in the United States. It remains so despite the latest fashion of the legal fiction of, quote, color blindness, end quote. How people are treated in court, how they are charged, and how they are sentenced are direct reflection of what race and ethnicity they are and how such traits are regarded by white America. Several years ago, a prominent American law professor asked his students to imagine they would wake up the next day as black folks. The white students reasoned that such a, quote, disability, end quote, required monetary damages of a million dollars a year for life. Why damages? Unless color does matter. Unless whiteness is a valued property which, when lost, demands a premium payment and black is devalued. Americans are blind to everything but color. All right. And then that brings us to the next passage. Uh, so, again, I'm going to check the time here. And I think we're probably pulling up to the 30 minute mark. OK, we had about the 24 minute mark. And so from that passage, I think the. Uh, 
that actually that passage and the passage before both of them make me think of the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Uh, the the full title of it is the new Jim Crow mass incarceration in the era of color blindness, or maybe in the age of color blindness, uh, by Michelle Alexander. And both of those, uh, these last passages make me think about that. Uh, the, this passage, when it speaks about how <clears throat> we live in a society where, where, where this idea of color blindness is pushed, uh, when in reality, everything that exists in this society is, uh, steeped in, uh, racism or colorism or white supremacy uh, because of the fact that we have not strayed as much as people uh, may, uh, you know, a lot of times we don't take the time to think of it, think about it, but we have not strayed from a lot of those ideals and ideologies which first uh, birthed this society and first birthed this nation. Uh, we, they have, they've They've adjusted, they've reformed. Some of those ideas have been reformed to make people more comfortable with them and to include more people in them. But that is not a changing or alteration of those ideas or those concepts. Uh, and so uh, the one of the things that you hear people say often is this idea that, uh, oh, I don't see color or color doesn't mean anything to me. Color doesn't matter to me. And uh, I think that that is something that uh, is uh uh, uh, you know, a, a wish to get to or a desire to maybe to get to at some point in some type of uh, uh, far off place. But where we are at currently to deny the existence of color or to deny that the seeing of color uh, is to deny the realities of our society. And when you get into a place of when you start denying reality, uh, you make it. So that is how you uh, uh continue a status quo that is how you continue uh cycles of oppression and cycles of exploitation is by denying that they exist uh and so we have to get to a place where people become comfortable with admitting that color exists where people become comfortable with with uh having the conversation of saying well maybe you individually feel as if you don't see color and color does not matter to you uh but when you go to work at a job the job that you work at is more likely to hire a white person than they are to hire a black person Person. Uh, when you get pulled over the city that you live in, when police are pulling people over, they're more likely to pull over a black person than they are to pull over uh, you as a white person. Uh, the the when a child is born uh, in a hospital, if the child's mother is black, the child's mother is three times as likely to die giving birth uh, to the child. And these are all things that are. Uh, uh, systemic and systematic issues that are much bigger than the individual, that uh, encompass the institution, that encompass the society. And so the denial on an individual level of seeing color uh, does nothing to address the fact that institutionally and at a, a on a broader scale, color is written into everything that exists here. You are, if you go to get a, two families go to get a, a loan from a bank, the family that is white is more likely to get the loan from the bank. Uh, and, you know, and those things go go on and on. And they've been that way for since the beginning of this uh, country, since the beginning of this nation. And have they uh, have they uh, uh, adjusted some? Yes, they've adjusted some uh, because of pressure being put onto some of those things. Uh, but to deny their existence is uh is it's negligent and we have to get to a place where we talk to people about how it is not about you individually not seeing color uh, uh the criminal justice system sees color uh the institution of policing sees color uh the education system of education sees color uh and so we have to uh get people who may individually be in a, a place where they don't see color or color is not a thing to them to uh be able to accept the fact that these uh, institutions do see color. Uh, let's see. Let's see where we at on time. I just, I just checked that, but oh yeah, yeah, we got, we gonna knock one more passage out. Okay. All right, let's do next passage. We are on a history of betrayal, October 29th, 1998. United States history is a study in denial for much of what is taught as history in the schools of the nations bears little relationship to the lives lived by millions of men, women, and children on the land we now call America. Most schools teach that which is safe and mostly false. 
So much so that shock and disbelief are usually the result of telling a history that reveals that many of the men called, quote, founding fathers, end quote, were enslavers, visceral racists, and, in a word, creeps. Dedicated to the erection of a, quote, white man's republic, end quote, as supported in the 1857 Supreme Court opinion by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney in Dred Scott v. Sanford, many of the nation's leaders, congressmen, and presidents were virulent racists who made every effort to deny any semblance of justice to black freedmen in the hellish aftermath of the Civil War. How many Americans know that more than 37,000 black men died while serving in the Union Army? The people who fought to preserve the Union, who fought against the secessionists and enslavers, returned to a South where virtually every promise made to them was shattered and broken, often by the very government they have fought to defend. While the war was raging, General Sherman assigned thousands of acres to freedmen on the land that was vacated by white enslavers or confiscated. These lands, on which more than 40,000 freedmen and their families tussled with the earth to create a life, were summarily snatched away from them by the U.S. government. In October 1865, General Howard traveled to, quote, Sherman Land, end quote, to revoke titles to lands confiscated during the war in order to return them to their previous white owners. General Howard's instructions to the so-called freedmen, quote, put aside your bitter feelings, end quote, and, quote, become reconciled, end quote, to your old enslavers. The people who have suffered indignity and bondage for centuries, who worked to enrich the national economy, told the U.S. general, quote, no, never, end quote, and, quote, can't do it. End quote. Howard Merriman, formerly enslaved in Mississippi, described the condition of emancipated black folk during the period of the Great Betrayal, 1865 through 1866, as thus. No land, no house, not so much as a place to lay our head. Despised by the world, hated by the country that gives us birth, denied of all our rights as a people, we were friends on the march. Brothers on the battlefield, but in the peaceful pursuits of life, it seems that we are strangers. Abolitionist Wendell Phillips aptly noted that without the vote, blacks would be doomed to a, quote, century of serfdom, end quote. He wasn't far wrong. Blacks fought and died for the Union, and after the war, they were forsaken, treated as if they were the enemy of the very nation that they had fought and bled for. Here in the aftermath of carnage, white supremacy was the law and blackness was a crime. That was the reality that leads to today, the history that created the days and nights of this very hour. When the United States was formed, it was constituted by an act of compromise that left half of the nation slave and the other half of the nation, quote, free, end quote. A hundred years later, and even after the raging horrors of war had ripped the nation apart, a new compromise was reached between the North and South. In the words of one supporter of President Andrew Johnson, that compromise was based on this central tenet, quote, keeping the nigger down, end quote. For a century after, quote, emancipation, end quote, black folks in the main were denied every substantive right of the U.S. citizen. Voting, holding office, jury service, freedom of travel, freedom of assembly, freedom to collective bargaining, etc. Far from free or equal, blacks found themselves condemned to a new life where the state took the place of the slave master and did everything in its power to control black labor in the interests of the landowner's class. For most of the American history, so-called, quote, law, end quote, was merely white whim. Black life, considered cheap as slavery, became, quote, free, end quote, and worthless in, quote, freedom, end quote. As historian Eric Forner notes, sheriffs, justices of the peace, and other local officials proved extremely reluctant to prosecute whites accused of crimes against blacks. To do so, said a Georgia sheriff, would be, quote, unpopular, end quote, 
and dangerous, while an Arkansas counterpart told a Freedmen's Bureau agent that to take action against a planter who had defrauded freedmen, quote, would defeat him in the coming fall election, end quote. That was the reality that leads to today. The roots of a repression that still blocks sunlight and makes black life so hellish still. And then that brings us to our next passage. Uh, and so I'm going to end that. I'm going to end. We're going to end the Rockford reading this episode two right here. But let's uh, have a reflection upon that last passage that we read. Uh, I think the one of the first things that sticks out to me about that passage is how uh, black, the, just black life and black existence has always been uh, in this society used as a political tool as uh, whether it be Abraham Lincoln saying that if he could preserve the union with slavery, he would. And if he could preserve the union uh, by uh, emancipation, he would. Uh, whether it be the fact that Bill Clinton is uh, uh, the fact that Bill Clinton is said to, you know, people said that Bill Clinton was the first black president and Bill Clinton went on TV and played the trumpet or something he played in. Uh, you know, it was pushed as this narrative was pushed that, you know, Bill Clinton loved black people and black people love Bill Clinton. And all the while, you know, Bill Clinton would uh, pass the, the police bill that he passed in the 90s, the crime bill he passed in the 90s that would uh, balloon uh, mass incarceration to what we you know, the, some of the things we know today that would increase the police budget and create police programs that uh, we know today have been detrimental to uh, generations of black families. And, uh, I, and you know, even Lyndon B. Johnson, who was a, a, a segregationist, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson was a segregationist. Once he uh, took the office of uh, president, you know, he would be one of the people that would sign some of the uh, bills that are uh, are known to be uh, monumental in uh, uh, the black American history. And so uh, at every turn, you know, we see how uh, the black existence is used as uh, a political tool. And we can even fast forward that to uh, Joe Biden. Currently, when Joe Biden was running for election, he said that if you didn't vote for him, then you weren't black. Uh, you know, and so all of these different things just gets us into a place of of understanding uh, how black life and uh, uh, black existence has been uh, used as a political tool. Uh, but I do think that once you understand those things, there's power in that. There's power in uh, uh, being a, a, a black or, or, or being a, being unified and being organized and being able to take back that power. Uh, I think one of the ways that is uh one of the examples that I can think of is uh, Booker T. Washington. It was uh, a man was running to be governor uh, and Booker T. Washington told he was a Republican and Booker T. Washington told him that uh, he would support him if, if after he got elected, he would make it so that Booker T. Washington would have uh, the land and some of the a grant, some grant money and they would be able to uh, begin to create a college. And uh, the person running for governor agreed. And uh, when the election came around, you know, Booker T. Washington got the uh, black community to uh, vote as a block. The governor was elected uh, and then uh, the land was given and grant money was given for uh, Booker T. Washington to begin uh, building uh, Tuskegee and uh, begin uh, building the college there. So uh, that is uh, just one example. Uh, but when you understand that if you are, if, you know, if, if our existence here, which it has at this point, is something that is uh, looked at as a, a political instrument or looked at as a political weapon, we have to uh, take that political instrument and political weapon uh, back into our own hands and take that power back into our own hands. And so uh, that's one of the things that... Uh, uh, stands out to me from that uh that last segment there uh and and let's end it there i don't want to over talk or double talk want to keep these uh short and sweet and straight to the point uh so whatever uh app you're listening to this on or platform you listen to this on please share this uh if the if it's more episodes out please go listen to the other episodes that's out uh if you haven't listened to the prior episode please go listen to the episode one uh and we outside.